Patrick for, for this introduction. And actually, it's very interesting. I just thought that uh, Madison was my first university I've ever been to in the United States. Uh, that was 1990. It was still the Soviet Union, the very last year of the Soviet Union, just before its collapse. And it was also the time of crisis and opportunity. So now I'm coming back here and again speaking about the crisis in Russia, but also about the opportunities. Of course, uh, you see, if you read uh, uh, Western media, what is uh, said there, what is written there about Russia, I mean, uh, you will probably have a, an impression that you're getting into some kind of uh, mystery land of, uh, kind of, I don't know, uh, inhabited by some kind of Disney characters, probably, because uh, the, the picture is uh, uh, that of a society where, on the one hand, you have a totally authoritarian, terrible government, then you have some great, nice uh, dissident uh, liberals, and then you probably have some strange population which is totally obedient, which is uh, uh, totally composed of slaves and uh, people with the, with the psychology of slavery and so on and so on and so on or uh, you just don't get an image at all so you just get uh, get completely confused about what is reported and uh, in that sense uh, you know I just remember there was a, a famous um, famous line famous uh, famous episode in uh, one of, of the novels of Soviet writer Mikhail Bulgakov, who you probably know, uh, as the author of Ma uh, Master Margaret, but also there was his other uh, story called uh, Dog's Heart. So one of the characters uh, report, uh, there spoke to another, uh, reported, or reported to another character that he had all sorts of problems with, uh, with uh, inability to sleep at night and then the other character says you rather not read Soviet newspapers before going to sleep <laughs> uh, so uh, I think uh, what I advise you uh, you rather not read the media uh, not read the mainstream newspapers on Russia before going to sleep because then you will have all sorts of problems with, with uh, insomnia I imagine uh, saying this, I do not want to say that the situation in Russia is any kind of good or, 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 uh, or positive. What I'm saying is that even when the Western media reports Russian crisis, it reports the wrong crisis, not the one which really happens. It is reporting uh, events of no importance and not reporting some of the most important events. And so on and so on. It is referring to the conflicts and people who are uh, hardly producing any effect uh, on the current life in the country and not reporting on many uh, many people and many events and conflicts which are really happening and which are really important. But to make things worse I should tell you that Russian media is no better. Uh, it's not only that it misreports what's happening around the world, it also uh, systematically misreports what's happening around our own country. So in that sense, uh, you should not just blame Western journalists. They, they pick up what they can from, from Russian media and from their sources, and that's what the situation is. And now let's try to speak about what's, what's really happening. First of all, uh, uh, the economy is uh, really in contraction, uh, and uh, uh, this is not only a recession, but it probably is going to be uh, a recession which uh, doesn't look like any previous recession in, in the history of capitalist Russia because uh, capitalist Russia, since the, the restoration of capitalism in Russia, we uh, already had at least uh, two major recessions. So one was in the 1990s, which was a, a, a very dramatic uh, decline in the uh, Russian economy. Actually, probably it was the worst peacetime uh, destruction of, of economy uh, uh, in, in modern history because Russia lost about 40% of its industrial production within a period of six years. 
which is uh, almost unprecedented. I, I don't know whether any other post-communist Eastern European countries had similar uh, uh, disasters. Maybe some of them did, by the way, I, because I, I, uh, I'm no specialist uh, in, 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 the con in the economic history of Albania, for example, uh, or, or, or Romania. So I imagine that the picture in Romania or Albania or, or no, no one to speak about Tajikistan or, uh, could have, or, or, or Georgia could have been quite similar. So in that sense, mm, uh, the Russia was not unique, but uh, it was unique for a major European industrial power. Uh, because, of course, there was a lot of deindustrialization happening all over the world in the late 20th century, but nowhere it happened so fast and so dramatically. And it was accompanied with uh, uh, enormous social dislocation because the, the whole way of life, the whole Soviet way of life also collapsed, and the, the whole uh, worldview of, of generations collapsed. So that was a very dramatic recession. Uh, and uh, then there was a recession uh, in 1998, which uh, just happened uh, it was a recession after a recession, so, uh, it, so that um, the economy in 1997 just started to begin to recover, and then there was yet another recession which was accompanied by the ruble crash, uh, which was also part of the global financial crisis of 1998. And then we had a, a, quite a dramatic recession in 2008, together with the rest of the world as part of the global crisis. So in that sense, you can imagine Russian society is one that is quite used to recessions. So we know how to live under recessions. It's not a big problem. However, this one is different for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, situation of 1990s, no matter how dramatic it looks in terms of character, in, ter in, terms, of, uh, in terms of data, in terms of, uh, in terms of statistics, uh, it was not that simple because uh, though on the one hand we had an enormous uh, decline of industry, but at the very same time new opportunities were emerging for the new generation. Uh, because uh, quite a few jobs which didn't exist in the Soviet system were emerging. Uh, quite a few uh, areas, quite a few um, branches of economy were emerging. Like, for example, uh, the Soviet Union never had uh, mass international tourism. So travel companies were flourishing, and uh, travel agencies, uh, tourist agencies, they were, they were emerging out of nowhere. There were hundreds and thousands of them emerging uh, because people were allowed to travel abroad. Okay, and uh, private banks were emerging, commercial financial institutions were emerging because earlier we only had state banks, which had a totally different character, and. Uh, People were able to start their own companies, their own businesses. Uh, quite a few people became self-employed, and so on and so on. The economy was dramatically deregulated, and this deregulation led to uh, enormous dislocation and enormous sacrifice for the population, but also it opened up certain possibilities for certain people who managed to, to kind of catch the, 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 these opportunities. And of course, the new bourgeoisie was emerging, and uh, uh, that also was accompanied with uh, uh, tremendous growth of inequalities, but also this bourgeoisie was creating its own service sector. This is the whole new sector providing services for the rich. So quite a few people were making money on providing these services. So in that sense, it was a combination of disastrous uh, contraction, disastrous decomposition of the old Soviet way of life and also Soviet economy, uh, and uh, the opening up uh, for, for a whole generation of people who were capable of using these new opportunities. And that's why uh, this uh, economic disaster didn't lead to any major um, political collapse. Though there, there were very serious political conflicts, like in 1993 when Yeltsin organized the coup d'etat, and I was myself one of the victims of this coup d'etat because I was arrested as opposing it. Uh, there were mass protests and so on, but still uh, the system managed to survive, and uh, though Yeltsin was extremely unpopular and hated by the population, nevertheless he managed to last till the end of his uh, term and uh, pass the, the 
Uh, the presidency to, uh, to Putin, he was, uh, was his candidate, he was handpicked by him and the top oligarchs as the person to normalize the situation, which Putin really did. And uh, what we had in the, nine, in, the, in the period after 2000 was, <coughs> that, uh, was a period of uh, growing, uh, systematically growing consumption. Because uh, by then, first of all, new capitalist economy more or less established itself in Russia. Uh, then, uh, what is very important, oil prices started growing, and prices for some other commodities, uh, mostly raw materials, which Russia exported, were growing. So as a result of that, uh, consumption started uh, growing, and uh, economy recovered, although it was a very strange recovery, because c consumption was growing fine, uh, also, statistically, the economy looked good. It was showing growth rates uh, almost uh, similar to those of China. Uh, but in reality, what was happening, it was uh, some kind of uh, growth without, almost without investment. So, for example, they kept using old Soviet equipment and machinery, just trying to squeeze as much as possible out of these machines and people. Also, they didn't train uh, labor force, so they used the old Soviet labor force, which was trained by the Soviet Union uh, to produce more and more and more. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the economy was growing, but it was not really developing. That was exactly the problem. There was a growth without development. So the term growth without development was invest uh, invented by Latin American economists uh, already in the 1970s for a completely different uh, situation. But I think Russia in the uh, era of Putin, in the period of Putin, would be a perfect illustration uh, uh, to this uh, thesis, to this concept, because uh, there was definitely economic growth, and uh, there was definitely a success story of a sort, because I should tell you that lives of millions of people really improved, and improved quite dramatically, and that was one of the reasons why uh, also we had political stability for all these years. You know, but at the same time, uh, the economy structurally was getting weaker rather than stronger. Maybe another comparison will be with Clinton years in this country. In a certain sense, there can be a comparison that everything looked good, uh, consumption was on the rise, uh, so all financial and, and uh, economic indicators looked good. At the same time, there were increasing uh, structural problems which are accumulating and accumulating and accumulating and not, not resolved. And so in that sense, uh, the story of Russia in the 2000s is not unique at all, uh, but uh, it's very extreme in a certain sense. Uh, but what is also important for that period is that uh, a very specific social and political model emerged, which is associated with Putin, and which has very little with the image of Putinism which you can get from the Western media. Because if you read the Western media, you uh, have an image of a heavy-handed dictator which controls everything and everybody which manages everything and, and so on and so on. And everybody is just so terrorized or so, so shy as they never say a word against and, and, and it's a very, very controlled uh, society and, and state. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, the uh, model of Putin was based on uh, the president on the top guy being extremely weak and his weakness was exactly his strength because there were different oligarchy groups, different <coughs> corporations, different interest groups which were competing under Yeltsin and during the period of Yeltsin they were almost killing each other, sometimes physically killing each other so they were always fighting among themselves so uh, what uh, happened under Putin was that uh, this, the, the presidential administration started functioning as the arbiter between interest groups. So in that sense, Putin uh, became the top mediator, the, the absolute mediator between different groups. His policy was always uh, to listen to everyone, to listen to every, uh, every single interest groups, group, uh, every single interest group, to every single oligarch, every single corporation, uh, learn what they want, and try to satisfy everybody and try to arrange a compromise that nobody is angry, nobody is happy with what's happening. But that was uh, only possible as long as uh, there was uh, the oil money coming. The oil, the petrodollars were, were coming, uh, the oil money is there, and once it is there, uh, it is very easy to satisfy everybody. <laughs> because as long as uh, 
uh, the money was there, even when in a particular arrangement, in a particular uh, decision, uh, there was someone who didn't get completely happy, completely satisfied. Uh, this side was still capable of expecting that next time, in the next turn of negotiations, the, 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 this uh, good uh, mediator is going to remember that somebody was not totally happy, so he's going to be satisfied and he's going to be compensated at the, at the next round of negotiations, the next round of, of compromise. So, so the whole system was a system of permanent compromise, permanent dynamic compromise, which was made and remade and, uh, time and again. Uh, and uh, what is also very important is that uh, the uh, people, the majority of the population, of course, they were not institutionally uh, in, involved in the process of compromise making, this process of decision making by compromise, through compromise. But in fact, uh, the, uh, I should say the strong side of the, of, the, of the system was that they considered the importance of their, uh, of their uh, population, that the population had to be more or less satisfied as well. So imagine it's a kind of compromise between wolves uh, who also consider that uh, sheep must uh, stay alive, more or less. <laughs> uh, so, so that's basically the kind of, of, kind of system we've got. Uh, so, uh, of course, there was one uh, moment when uh, this compromise from the elite side was uh, really under serious threat. It was 2005, when at some point, uh, the new liberal part of Russian elite, especially associated with the financial sector, started getting uh, extremely angry that too much is left of the welfare state, there is too much of the welfare state, which is not dismantled, which is not uh, completely abandoned. Uh, that was the first stage of Russia's negotiations with the uh, World Trade Organization, and the World Trade Organization was insisting on Russia dismantling some of its welfare institutions, as contradicting the uh, WTO uh, arrangements which were already in place uh, and they did try to do that uh, in January 2005 they uh, launched uh, uh, the campaign to as they called it to monetize the benefits basically to uh, to make some uh, sectors of uh, uh, Soviet, of po for post-Soviet uh, population, like, for example, senior citizens who enjoyed particular benefits, abandoned these benefits for some symbolic financial compensation. In fact, that resulted in mass riots and protests all over the country with millions of people uh, going to the streets. And uh, that was a very good lesson since then. Quite for a while, uh, the uh, ruling elite decided not to touch the welfare state. On the contrary, actually, the uh, money was coming into uh, the welfare system, and uh, the money was coming into educational system. The money was coming into uh, healthcare system. Uh, usually, that money was used in a very inefficient way, but still, uh, for education, healthcare, uh, and uh, and so on, it was better to have at least uh, this inefficient investment than to have no investment. And of course, uh, again, it is also very important that during this period they managed to commercialize the housing system, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, they commercialized the transportation system, which is now quite felt in Russian society that it made life much tougher for considerable groups of population, which depended on cheap transportation and cheap housing before. Uh, but because during this period of time uh, the middle class was actually growing, not only getting better off, but also growing in numbers, so e uh, that meant that even the poorer layers of the population, they, they kind of agreed on that, uh, saying, okay, probably we, have, we are going to pay more, but well, so the salaries are going to increase and we have a chance to become middle class ourselves, so um, most, maybe it's not such a bad thing that they're commercializing housing because at least we will probably have chances to improve our, our housing conditions through buying or exchanging flats and so on and so on. But uh, healthcare and education remained uh, very much within uh, the, uh, the system of welfare state, very much subsidized and, uh, and non-commercial. 
and uh, of course the pension system uh, more or less recovered after the disastrous situation of the 1990s when pensions were uh, below the misery level and in the 2000s the pensions didn't become very high but at least they uh, became kind of uh, uh, good enough to survive the pension uh, pensioners for the for the senior citizens. So uh, all that looked quite good, as I told you, till uh, the, uh, the the big economic crisis. And of course, Russia survived the first shock of the uh, global crisis in 2008. For one uh, very simple reason, Russia was saved by the Federal Reserve. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a famous saying of uh, Alexander II, Russian Tsar, or very reactionary Russian Tsar of the uh, 19th century, who said that Russia has only two allies, its army and its navy. <laughs> uh, so, so, and recently, um, Vasily Kaltashov, uh, my colleague, a uh, Russian economist, said that Russia has only two allies, Federal Reserve of the United States and Chinese Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, why? Because uh, when uh, in 2008 oil prices collapsed, they also collapsed to the level of $40 per barrel, uh, Russian economy contracted in a very, very rapid way, and they discovered that though uh, they accumulated a huge uh, foreign currency reserves uh, and gold, uh, golden uh, foreign currency reserves, these reserves, no matter how huge they were, started disappearing very, very fast, within months. And it looked quite, quite uh, dramatic, quite, quite bad, till the moment when Federal Reserve uh, actually turned on its printing press. When Federal Reserve turned on the printing press, when uh, the this uh, what's the, uh, uh, the the system? Well, how was the? I don't remember the, the American term. Uh, e qualitative easing started. Uh, so what happened? They uh, well, plenty of of these dollars uh, flooded financial markets, and of course the money didn't go into the pockets of the public. The money didn't go into into production. The money didn't go into into welfare. Uh, the money didn't go to the American people. Uh, the money went to financial institutions, uh, which uh, uh, used uh, this money for speculation, which is quite natural, because that's the way to, to make money faster, to, to, to bring this money back faster. And uh, what happened next? Uh, oil is among uh, the commodities which are best for speculation. So even though the actual demand for oil was not really increasing, was not really increasing fast enough, at least, it was increasing somewhat, but production was actually increasing faster than the demand. So it was a, it was a, a, an oil production of oil situation already in 2008. Well, by the way, remember, it was so long ago. And the oil production situation continued for years and years and years on the global market. Why? Because uh, they were just uh, selling this oil as a speculation commodity. So, uh, like a tanker moving from uh, from Abu Dhabi, say, to Amsterdam, was sold and resold plenty of times before it arrived anywhere. So it was also the oil which was still in the uh, in the ground, which was already sold and resold with futures uh, uh, futures uh, uh, transactions. So. Uh, uh, that allowed uh, the oil prices go up and uh, the oil money came to Russia. And uh, Chinese Politburo also for the same reason, because in 2008 China launched a huge expansion program, which actually led to some absurd projects like building empty cities, which are not populated because there are no people to, to live in these cities, because there are no jobs in these this cities and no economy. But still, it needed uh, oil, it needed metal, it needed uh, uh, quite a lot of other uh, elements. Uh, it needed bricks, uh, concrete, and so on and so on. Uh, so that created demand, uh, the physical demand for Russian, for some of the Russian products. And also that 
stabilize the price of oil at a very high level. Uh, so uh, that's why in 2008 uh, there was uh, uh, Chinese Politburo and Federal Reserve uh, coming to, maybe without any, any special purpose, but coming to save uh, Russian government and, and, and Russian capitalism, and it did work. Uh, however, uh, good things never last. And uh, as we know now, uh, the, the crisis actually returned, uh, and uh, while uh, United States uh, elites uh, and, and financial elites understand that you cannot simply pr keep printing dollars without any end, because that would lead to, uh, to money losing value, uh, they also understand that uh, the money is losing its capacity to be the tool of accumulation if you print too much money. So the accumulation process is undermined if you're, uh, if you're becoming irresponsible in terms of uh, letting your printing press work too fast and too hard. So the quality of easing stopped. And uh, China also is facing uh, serious problems. Chinese economic growth now is at the lowest level for, for many years. And I think this proportions and contradiction of Chinese economy are uh, increasing to such an extent that uh, there are reasons to expect a serious economic crisis in China as being the next big chapter of the history of, of the global economic crisis. But of course, uh, Russia contracted much earlier when the oil prices went down. However, what is really interesting is that the Russian economy started getting into stagnation before oil prices actually collapsed. Why? Because uh, the way the system operated, uh, it needed not only high oil prices, it needed oil prices to keep growing systematically. So it's not only enough to have high oil prices, but it's very important that the prices keep growing and growing and growing. Among other things, that was exactly the system of uh, dynamic compromise created by Putin, because it also meant uh, that uh, every participant of the game expected more and more donations, more and more, more benefits, more and more uh, opportunities uh, from the system. And to satisfy everybody, uh, the government had to provide more and more of these opportunities. So the biggest last opportunity was the Olympic Games. Olympic Games. Uh, the Olympic Games uh, uh, was, uh, uh, it was a real record because on the one hand, it was uh, the best uh, Olympic Games for Russia for many years. So the Russian Olympic uh, teams, they won quite a few medals and that was a tremendous success actually for Russian sport, especially after the failure of the previous Winter Olympics when in Vancouver Russian, uh, ga Russian teams failed. Uh, but at the same time, it was the most expensive Olympics ever. Not only the most expensive Winter Olympics, but it was the most expensive Olympics period ever. So they managed to beat Chinese, they managed to beat London. And, and, uh, why? Uh, again, because that was an opportunity to spend money and give, uh, and give this money to construction companies, or to all sorts of contractors, and so on and so on. Uh, so, uh, once the Olympics uh, were over, they all, then all of a sudden they discovered that, that the budget was, in, uh, in fact, out of money. Just spent everything on the Olympics. So we waved flags, we were very happy, we won the Olympics. <laughs> and, and so what? <laughs> and now, by the way, they have all sorts of problems with Sochi, with the city of the Olympics, because they don't know what to do with the. Uh, with all these facilities which they built. Among other things, it's built in the subtropical area. So you have all the winter sports, uh, all the facilities for winter sports which were built in, in the subtropical area, uh, including that they had to import snow into Russia. Uh, because, uh, but they had to, but they could not just bring snow from, from say, Siberia to Sochi because it will melt. So they, they need specifically high-tech snow specific high-tech production of snow, which Russia couldn't produce, so they bought, Russia bought snow in Israel. <laughs> so that was something. Uh, well, because Israel is um, technologically more advanced, they produce snow which doesn't melt. Uh, 
<laughs> which we can't, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, anyhow, uh, the problems started uh, long before the, the, the drop in oil prices, and the conflicts within the elite started increasing. And uh, that partly preconditioned the protests of uh, 2011 and, and uh, 2012, because uh, again, you can say, okay, yes, people protested against unfair elections. It is true. People did protest in December 2011 against unfair elections. I participated in these protests myself. The problem is uh, that uh, the elections of 2011 were among the fairest <laughs> Russia had <laughs> since 1993. Uh, so electoral fraud was a permanent characteristic of Yeltsin's regime. Actually, Putin did a lot to minimize electoral fraud. Actually, under Putin, there was less electoral fraud than under uh, Yeltsin, though uh, the way they achieved it was also very specific. They started controlling the electoral process at the start, not at the end. So instead of uh, falsifying the final result of the election, what they started doing, uh, they started uh, actually uh, controlling the entrance, not allowing the candidates who were considered to be suspicious uh, to run. And, uh, all, for example, registering an op a party became almost impossible, according to Russian legislation. But all registered parties, before going to elections, they had to, it was informal, there was no law, but there was a rule that they had to submit their electoral lists to the presidential administration. And they uh, just controlled the electoral lists of every single party which was running. So that situation, you cannot lose. And, of course, one of the points was that the they were very concentrated on not having strong opposition candidates, and opposition candidates were not very different from the government candidates. In this situation, however, it means that people really voted for the pro-government United uh, Russia Party. Because if you have a fake opposition and a real pro-government party, why should you vote for the fake opposition if you have these people from the pro-governmental party, which at least are doing something, practically? I mean, they, were, they, are, they were doing, they were delivering. As I told you, the, the living standards were growing. All these people were bureaucrats who were known for, I don't know, like uh, I repaired, uh, imagine this, there were slogans, I repaired a bridge here and there. <laughs> I, I fixed the road here and there. I mean, really, the road was really fixed. Eh? And then they see a, a guy with a tie uh, uh, saying, I fixed that road. And then just recently there was a, a, a big poster uh, in the internet, and I think it was even printed somewhere. So the, instead of this guy with, with, with a tie and, and a smart suit, uh, there was a, a Tajik guest worker, construction worker, Tajik construction worker. Uh, uh, and the slogan goes, they align. It's me who is building the road. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, actually, uh, of course, <laughs> you can understand that uh, in this situation, uh, people had uh, real, uh, real reasons to, to prefer the government party to the opposition parties, which, uh, which presented no alternative. But uh, uh, the problem which they had, with, uh, which actually led to a new wave of electoral fraud, was a very specific problem. People just stopped voting altogether. They just stopped coming to the polling stations. So the real uh, turnout was like 15 to 30 percent. Mm -hmm. And though Russian legislation has no, uh, no limit to, to the number, to the percentage of voters, so even if one person votes, that's enough to, for election to be valid, in moral terms, in political terms, in ideological terms, it was very important that uh, they had to announce that the majority of the population voted. And uh, I remember interviewing uh, a guy from uh, an electoral commission who was reporting on, on massive electoral fraud he was involved in, and uh, uh, he said that they've got only 15% of the voters, uh, the voter turnout, and they had to, uh, uh, to pretend that it was 60%. And I said, what about the proportion of votes uh, divided between political parties? Oh, he said, no, 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 we did it honestly. This fraud was done in a totally honest way. 
everybody get uh, everybody got exactly the right percentage. <laughs> <laughs> so just the numbers were inflated. But the percentage was correct, so everybody got exactly as much as it got from the in, in the original uh, situation. But so but in 2011, presidential administration some, for some strange reason decided to learn what was the real situation. Because they didn't know, because it was, well, because you see all this fraud, it was not uh, some kind of organized fraud at the level of, of the central government. They, uh, they just uh, knew that, uh, all, all local bureaucrats, they knew that if your, your province had turned out, say, 20%, and the neighboring province has uh, uh, turned out like 60%, uh, you will look bad uh, from the point of view of Kremlin. So, you, so they inflated figures all the provincial governments and federal figures. At some point, the people at the Kremlin, they learned that, and they started uh, getting interested, what's the real situation on the ground? And in 2011, actually, there was an instruction uh, to count the real numbers, which exactly provoked the problem, because they started counting the real numbers. And first of all, uh, in, uh, uh, and you know, Russia is a very long country, so it's not, uh, it's nine uh, uh, time zones. Uh, so uh, used to be nine, now it's eight time zones, but it doesn't make a big difference. So, <laughs> so what happened was that uh, in Moscow they were getting the results, and uh, they've got the their, their, their terrible results because uh, first of all they've learned that in the far east, in the far east, first of all, not so many people vote, and then because uh, the uh, people also used the opportunity to show that they were not very happy. So uh, the number of people who voted for the good or good opposition parties was quite high, especially because in the Far East, usually people voted uh, more against the United Russia than, uh, than in other regions. Also, it's uh, the region which is materially worse off than other regions. And uh, uh, there were conflicts with Moscow earlier during the crisis period because Moscow tried to block the import of uh, used uh, Japanese cars, which was a big business in, in the Far East. So in the Far East, you can never uh, find, in, in, in a place like uh, Yuvasakhalinsk, I've been recently, you can hardly find a car which is with, uh, which is with a proper wheel, wheel drive. You know, the, the, the wheel drive, uh, so they drive on the right, and all the cars are fit to drive on the left side, because <laughs> they're all Japanese. So, so it's very odd, you know. Uh, so um, as a result, uh, the Far East voted uh, basically not in a very good way. And uh, the results started coming to uh, Moscow. And the administration in Moscow at some point started panicking. And uh, when they were panicking, uh, it was just the time for uh, central Russia, to uh, the Ural region, to start uh, counting. And they at that point, they started calling governors in the Ural region, uh, saying, uh, well, we have to do something. We have, well, they, we ask you to count honestly, but uh, we don't do it. We don't ask you to do it anymore. <laughs> the, just correct, correct the results, please. <laughs> but you see, when you have an electoral fraud which is prepared and organized, it's prepared and organized. So you are ready, you have everything done. So you just have to go according to the plan. Imagine, it was like 10 minutes before the end of the story, and you have to change your plan totally and change everything. So then they started panicking, and they started doing stupid things. Like uh, a colleague of mine uh, reported a very interesting situation in Penza region. There was a, there was just a five minutes before the, cl the closure of the polls, there was a woman in, a, uh, in an electoral committee uh, sitting with all, she had two piles of papers, uh, ballots. So one was empty and the other had a United Russia crossed in. Uh, so she was just fill, uh, filling in the forms for the ballots for United Russia. Just everybody saw that. And she just did one and two and three and four and, and more and more ballots, just writing it very, very fast because she had only like five minutes to do it. And then one of the observers came and said, what are you doing? It's against the law. I said, don't stop me working. <laughs> <laughs> don't disturb me. I'm working. 
so, uh, and of course, that, that created a, a scandal, but also that created a series of absurd situations, the most famous of which was that in Rostov district, they are kind of over, they became over enthusiastic, <laughs> and they ended up reporting that 146% of the population voted. <laughs> <laughs> and that was on television. <laughs> I remember the whole country was watching that on television. One, when first, first it was a bit strange because one region reported 102 percent turnout. Then another region, I don't remember which one, reported 112 percent turnout. <laughs> but the record was Rostov region became famous, which reported you know, that it gets increasing and increasing and increasing, and that's all on television live. And then the the. Electoral Commission allowed that, according to the statistics of the rest of the region, 146% of the population already voted. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the whole, the whole country started laughing at that point. And uh, so we have this 146, uh, if you say 146%, uh, 46, uh, percent, it's, the, the, uh, it's the Chura figure. Chura was the head of the Electoral Commission. So that's the, it became the Chura number. It's like in, that, in Mexico in the 70s, there was a, a, a Sistema Cayo. A Sistema Cayo, when, the, when also they had the famous electoral fraud story, and the uh, chair of the Electoral Commission appeared on television and said the system collapsed uh, because they turned off the computer, <laughs> which was showing the wrong figures. <laughs> and, uh, and here Churov appeared and said, Well, we are very happy, 146% voted. <laughs> and just the whole country burst into laughter. <laughs> And um, the same evening, we already had demonstrations all over the country, protests and so on. Uh, but uh, well, that is just the, 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 the story um, on the surface. The, the story behind the surface is definitely that uh, I think the elite consensus started disintegrating. The elite consensus started getting, uh, getting less and less stable. And now what we are having is that actually uh, the big problem is that on the one hand we have a, a, a real power struggle that there is an opposition which is systematically attacking the government which is very very aggressively against the government and which is very visible which uh, uh, is creating the new situation of political conflict but then what we discover if you again go a little bit beneath the surface the struggle is not between the opposition and the government but the struggle is inside the government and the opposition is just uh, used as a tool by one faction of the government against another faction of the government. So the real struggle is inside the elite, inside the, inside the state. Just to give you two examples. Now one example uh, is uh, that every year we have uh, uh, an event called Gaidar Forum. You know, Igor Gaidar was uh, the prime minister under Boris Yeltsin, who is exactly the one who managed to destroy 40% of the industry in, in, in a few years. So he's very unpopular <laughs> with the people, and so he's extremely popular with the new liberal economists, or the new classical economists. So uh, Gaidar Forum is a place where every year all major economic ministers and all major opposition economists come together and plan together how to develop the country. So they come to the same, they, they, they just work together and in, the same, in the same work groups, in the same workshops, discussing strategies. So at the same time, the um, uh, government ministers in the Gaidar Forum make sometimes very strong statements against their colleagues, sometimes against Putin and others, uh, especially against those ministers in the government who are pre preventing them from dismantling the existing welfare state. Uh, so in that sense, it's very clear that uh, the factional divisions are much more important than the division between the, state, uh, the official state and the opposition. But just give you another example which is even more telling. We have two uh, uh, media outlets which are very, very important. One is NTV television. NTV uh, television station used to be a private station owned by Gusinski, by one of the former Yeltsin oligarchs, and Gusinski had to sell it to sell it. I'll tell you later why. But, uh, to, to whom? It's not important why. The important is to whom he sold it. So he sold, and now it's the uh, NTV, media, NTV television is the most aggressive pro-Kremlin media. It's absolutely pro-Kremlin. Of course, it is 
uh, backing Kremlin in everything. It's very aggressive against the opposition. Uh, given the fact that now we have a conflict with America, they're, they're now very anti-American and so on. So, so this kind of uh, media. Then there is another media uh, source, which is Echo Moskvi, Echo of Moscow, which is a radio station, which is extremely pro-liberal, extremely anti-Putin, extremely anti-Kremlin, extremely pro-American, uh, in the most extreme way. Now, the problem is that both of these media uh, enterprises are owned by the same company. <laughs> and this company is nothing but Gazprom, which is the biggest Russian company, half owned by the state. So it just tells you what is really happening. And uh, uh, again, uh, just to give, just coming to the situation with uh, with the, uh, with the, just have another ten minutes maybe. And, uh, with, with the crisis with the West, which Russia is now facing, I think we'll, be, we'll have to answer these questions because you cannot speak about the current crisis without speaking about Ukraine and, uh, and the conflict in, around in, and in Ukraine. Uh, I think it needs a very special detailed analysis because, again, I'm completely certain, that, um, I, I insist that the way this Ukrainian conflict is presented in, in the West is total misrepresentation for just one very important reason, that it is presented just as a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, without understanding that in reality it's a civil war in Ukraine, which of course includes Russian intervention, which is true that Russia is involved in the civil war in Ukraine, but without understanding that this is a civil war before everything, you can't understand anything happening there. And uh, here again, look, so the Russian official position is definitely Russia and next Crimea. Russia uh, is in conflict with the current Ukrainian government, no doubt about it. And uh, Russia backs the, the rebels in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. Okay, good. Russia sends, uh, Russia sends, uh, uh, arm, uh, sends uh, weapons, sends ammunition, sends fuel to the rebels. That's well known. Every Western media tells you so. And it's true. What you are not told is that, uh, for example, during uh, uh, spring and uh, summer campaign, in Ukraine, Russia sent no less military material to Ukrainian army than it sent to the rebels. For example, Ukrainian tanks are produced in Kharkov by Malasha factory, which is connected to the factory of uh, Deripaska in Russia. Deripaska is a, another, yet another big Russian oligarch. So Ukrainian tanks were made of spare parts of uh, components and were not possible, it was not possible to make them without the components from Russia. Uh, Mil uh, Helicopter Factory, which is another big corporation producing military, uh, military equipment, uh, they uh, sent their specialists to fix Ukrainian helicopters which were shot by the rebels. <laughs> uh, shot by, and uh, yet by, also by Russian uh, made uh, anti-aircraft missiles. Uh, but I can give you an example which is even more, uh, more dramatic. For example, you know that since Crimea was annexed uh, by Russia, uh, Ukrainian government announced financial boycott of Crimea and they uh, ordered uh, Ukrainian banks uh, to block uh, accounts, uh, the accounts in Crimea, to block uh, credit cards in Crimea and uh, actually to block uh, the financial process in, in, in Crimea. Uh, what are the biggest uh, banks in Crimea? The biggest bank in Crimea is Sberbank, which is exactly the, the biggest Russian bank, which is also partly owned by the state. So what happened? Sberbank was the one which led the boycott of uh, Crimean uh, financial, uh, fin uh, financial process, financial system. So they were the first to withdraw, the first to block their own bank uh, cash machines and their banks uh, they left Crimea and uh, some other Russian banks did the same following the orders of Ukrainian government rather than the orders of Russian government well because the Russian government ordered them to stay well they left but don't forget these are state-owned banks they, I mean they're not completely state-owned but they have 
the major state majority shares. Did something happen to, to any of these bankers? Nothing. No, no. These people appeared at Gaidar Forum also discussing how to continue reforming Russian economy. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that, in fact, first of all, the, the war in Crimea, uh, yeah, sorry, the war in, in Ukraine is uh, not only an Ukrainian civil war, it's also a Russian civil war. So different factions are fighting each other in Ukraine. Just the different Russian factions are fighting each other in the territory of Ukraine. Fortunately, so far, they can't do it inside Russia. Second important thing is that uh, this elite consensus cannot be continued for too long because it's already falling apart. But the final thing, which is also very important, is that, that the new liberal part of the segment, uh, section of Russian uh, elite is now winning in their attempts to dismantle the welfare state. So something which they failed to do in 2004, uh, 2005, they're trying to, to do in 2014 and 2015. For example, there is a systematic attack on the education. We are already announced that our society is too educated. We, we have, listen, we have an over-educated society. So the Ministry of Education says that this is absolutely intolerable, <laughs> and something has to be done about it. <laughs> and they're doing it, they're working hard. They're working hard. So the policy is to decrease the number of, ed of educational institutions in Russia within uh, three years by 50%. Uh, the same policy they have uh, in terms of uh, health care. And uh, they think uh, that uh, health care provided uh, by public uh, structures should be only in emergency cases. That means all everything, rest, uh, everything else has to be commercialized and privatized. Uh, but to do it, you first have to destroy the public health care system. So uh, they, in Moscow alone, uh, recently they closed down dozens of uh, health care institutions. And they uh, recently fired 8,300 doctors in Moscow alone. So I think this is going to produce inevitably a backlash. A backlash. Because if we had this backlash, in 2005, uh, around the issue of so-called benefits, uh, it was partly because people were uh, provoked immediately at, by one decision of the state. Now they're trying to do it uh, in a partial way, so that they are uh, cutting a healthcare system, uh, not the same day, the same, in the same way they're cutting the educational system. Uh, they are now trying to attack the pension fund, but uh, they're not doing all these things at the same time. Now, by the way, they have a great new idea about the pension reform. They think, uh, and that was already announced, they want women to have uh, smaller pensions than men. You know why? No, it's not about discrimination, no. It's because women live longer. <laughs> and because of that, they have to be punished. <laughs> They have, because they have the, it's about equality. It's about gender equality. The same amount of money for everybody. Women live longer, so it means that they have to get uh, less money on a monthly basis, basis. It's very logical. That's how neoliberal economists think. And uh, uh, finally, why is this crisis so unique? I, st I started with saying that this recession is unique. Why is it so unique? I think it is unique for, for two reasons. First, uh, in terms of uh, new opportunities, uh, they're not available, unlike the 1990s. There is nowhere to run from the recession. Like in the previous crisis, uh, there was an, an opportunity to, to run away into some new emerging sectors, the new so-called emerging markets. Uh, I hate the term because it's funny to say Russia is an emerging economy or emerging market. Russia has thousands, uh, thousands of years of history and, and uh, it was a major, a major industrial economy for at least for the 20th century. But anyhow, so there were emerging opportunities which are parallel to the declining state economy which were emerging there. So there was somewhere to run. There were always these new opportunities which compensated for the crisis of the, of, of, of the industrial economy. It's not the case now. That's one difference. Uh, the second difference is that 
of course, uh, well, we'll, we will not be able to sustain uh, the system of permanent, comp permanent compromise, dynamic compromise, which is characteristic for, for the, you know, for the uh, period of Putin. So in that sense, the crisis now is undermining the political system, which previous crises did not. And finally, uh, it is very typical that Putin recently said that, okay, don't worry, don't worry, well, the crisis will continue for a year or two, and then, uh, then the, the oil prices will start growing again, and it will be uh, business as usual. So we'll come back uh, uh, to the previous situation, everything will be exactly like it used to be before. But this is not going to happen. Whether the crisis is going to continue for a year or two or three years, it's not that important. The important thing is that after the crisis, things will not go the way they used to go before the crisis. Because structural changes are happening. And by the way, I think it's also the problem of Western elites as well. It's a global problem. Everywhere in the world, they're hoping that the crisis will pass and then everything will back to normal and everything will continue exactly the way it used to be before the crisis. Uh, and it's not going to happen. Uh, the time of change is only beginning. Thank you. Wonderful. So I think we can take some questions. So here yeah, and then. Yeah, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is: You didn't say anything about Russian military. Do they have any say in the way the government's run? And it, uh, what is their they do. position vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Putin and and the? Uh, they do. They are just one of these factions which are involved. And um, from my personal point of view, the military have a positive role to play because. For example, the military are the ones who are against the dismantlement, the destruction of the welfare state. They, uh, for their own reasons, not necessarily because they're so progressive, no. Mm -hmm. But they have their own reasons like stability and uh, also the military uh, officers and others, they are dependent on certain segments of the welfare state themselves. Uh, so, and also they, they want stronger industry. So for these reasons, they very often are in, in conflict with the with the uh, new liberal economists, but it's not about so much about the top top military. You know? It's more like the middle level industry, uh, military commanders. And also, of course, that explains much of what what was happening in, in the Ukrainian case. Because, uh, for example, if you take the case of Crimea, uh, it was uh, a, a very strange situation because. Uh, of course, the uh, Russian government definitely backed Crimea when it was trying to run away from Ukraine. That was absolutely clear. But in fact, they didn't plan initially to annex Crimea. They expected Crimea to become like uh, Northern Cyprus, the Republic of Northern Cyprus, or like uh, Abkhazia, like Transnistria. Russia already has these puppet governments around, like Transnistria, uh, Abkhazia, uh, North Os uh, South Ossetia. There were three, three republics which are dependent on Russia and which are formerly independent. Well, all, all they wanted it to be, all, all, okay, Kosovo, if you take the Western side, Kosovo. Uh, so that was how they saw that. And uh, contrary to that, uh, Crimean elites uh, were uh, in, insisting that uh, Crimea had to be officially uh, transferred to Russia for uh, two very important reasons. One reason was that uh, they wanted economic uh, support from Russia directly and legally, like pensions, uh, uh, salaries for public servants to be at the Russian level, which is probably uh, maybe twice as much as they used to be in, in Ukraine. But also important that you have to pay officially from your budget. We do not agree that you play all these games with us. And the second reason was that they were afraid of Ukrainian troops moving into Crimea. If Crimea was not officially taken over by Russia, then Ukrainian troops would have a possibility, like in case of South Ossetia, to, uh, to intervene. And by the way, there was a much greater risk of a war between Russia and Ukraine, a real war between Russia and Ukraine, happening if Russia didn't annex Crimea. Because then the South Ossetia situation was going to emerge with Russian troops being there, Ukrainian troops moving in, fighting, and Russian troops being officially there, and this is very important. Right? Uh, and uh, Ukrainian troops moving in, fighting the Apolchenia of, uh, of uh, Crimea, and uh, that would be a mess. 
So, but Putin was, hesi was hesitating, he was wavering, and uh, now we have a lot of material already published by the participants of these events, so that uh, quite a few ministers were against the annexation of Crimea, they were not against uh, Crimean succession from Ukraine, but they were against that formal annexation, formal, uh, formal uh, reunification with Russia. And uh, actually, uh, at that point, on the one hand, the Crimeans start, started doing everything on their own, declaring that uh, they were uh, entering Russia, even without any consent of Russian elites officially being announced. But they were backed by Russian military in Crimea who were involved in the process quite actively, and who influenced the decision-making in Moscow, saying, you have to back us. Now it's, it's a fait accompli. It's a fait accompli, you know? So that's, as, uh, for example, I wrote an article then saying it's not that Russia annexed Crimea, but Crimea finally annexed Russia. <laughs> 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 because they made the decisions, and they forced the Kremlin, the Kremlin to accept it. You know? okay. uh, yes, yeah, so two things that I'd like you to address in, uh, in more depth than you have. First of all, you say that uh, there is this battle within the Russian elite and inside the Russian state itself between, I, I guess it's a neoliberal, more pro-Western faction and a more nationalist, statist yes. faction. Yeah. This sounds exactly like what you could read in the New York Times over the past 10 years. This is, for example, the which what well, you didn't mention the entire imbroglio over Khodorkovsky and Yukos, right? This this was interpreted as an example of precisely that, some part of the state actually uh, reacting against the previous neoliberal gutting and privatization of the Soviet economy and so forth. And so it sounds like that's what, what you're talking about, but it's not clear to me, especially since in most interpretations of that fight I've seen Putin is considered to be a major player in, in terms of uh, a political decision maker. You're, you're portraying him as being weak and essentially buffeted about by other forces, but you haven't said what those forces are, at least on the nationalist side. Well, uh, there, there is no nationalist faction, actually. Uh, there are, if, and actually, but, you know, even if you're speaking about the neoliberal uh, pro Western faction, it's much more consolidated than the, uh, the so called nationalist faction. But in reality, it's not about nationalism or neoliberalism. Of course, uh, first of all, of course, in one way or another, they're all neoliberal. Uh, the difference is that there are so-called moderates, there are so-called moderates, and there are so-called uh, there are so-called uh, liberals. Uh, so, but the important thing, uh, thing is who is behind these factions. Uh, the neoliberal faction, uh, neoliberal fact faction, is uh, first and foremost financial capital, banks with Sberbank and so on. And the oil companies, and uh, including Gazprom, which is oil and gas. Who are their opponents? Their opponents are mostly in industry and uh, domestic industry, producing for domestic market, manufacturing. Interestingly enough, uh, in some cases, they're backed by foreign companies <coughs> which have production for Russian domestic market. So in that sense, it's not Russians versus foreigners. Uh, but those, it's a domestic market versus uh, uh, this kind of oil export strategy. And uh, then, very important, uh, regional governments. Regional governments are in open opposition to neoliberal ministers. It's a, it's a permanent struggle. And of course, they have very little chance to win uh, in the current situation because uh, the finance is centralized. And the finance is centralized and it's in the, in the hands of the finance ministry. And the final Minister of Finance is, uh, as you can guess, uh, just a, an executive of the banking community. No, nothing else than that. And uh, the provincial governors, uh, they are uh, they're lacking money, basically. They're just lacking money. They're strangled. But just give you one example. If you Putin is weak or strong, I, just, I can give you two examples. One example happened just very recently, and it's also very telling when uh, the... Uh, the, the, the railway company, Rossiyski Rezny Dorogi, RZD, the railway company simply decided to stop running suburban trains in a few provinces uh, because they say that these uh, trains are loss-making. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that because 
uh, the railway company actually controls just physically the rails and the finance. It doesn't control trains. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's privatized. It's, uh, and, uh, the, uh, it's like the British model of rail privatization. So they have cre they created all sorts of sm smaller companies which are operating particular segments of the, of the railways. And the efficiency of the whole system immediately decreased. And as a result of that, you show losses at some point. Uh, and uh, by the way, they're also showing losses partly because a lot of money is taken away from the country and ending up in Cyprus or, or in, in, in Riga. In Latvia, it's just uh, offshore. So anyhow, they just stopped uh, operating suburban trains. <coughs> then Putin intervened and said, uh, it's incredible that you just you're blocking whole towns uh, without transportation and so on. And I insist that they bring in the suburban trains. And then the next day, uh, Mr. Yukunin, who is the head of the railway, uh, Russian railway company, appeared and said, OK, if President uh, asks us to bring in the trains back, we will bring the trains back, but only if the government uh, pays us subsidies. And we are kind of uh, uh, um, making a, a move towards the, the government in the sense that if Putin promises, we believe that there will be money. So the trains are back, but if uh, Putin breaks his promise and the money is not coming, we'll withdraw the, the trains again. Uh, so, and uh, that just shows the balance of force between the president and, and these people. And, and, but another story is just hilarious because you know that Putin spent his uh, younger years as a KGB man in, in Germany, in East Germany, so he's very pro German in cultural terms. He loves everything German. And, and you know that we have this province, Kaliningrad province, uh, which is former East Prussia, uh, Königsberg. So the castle of Königsberg was uh, actually bombed by British and American aviation, but not destroyed. It was destroyed by the Soviet authorities in the 1970s. And, then, uh, and now it's a, it's a disaster. It's, a, it's an empty hill with, where they tried to build a party committee building in the late 1970s, early 1980s, that building uh, itself became a ruin. So instead of the, of, a ru of the ruins of a castle, they now have a ruin, uh, the ruined building of the party committee. And so Putin came there, and he signed a decree to rebuild the castle. He came there, they, 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 and he said that the, the castle has to be rebuilt. There was, a, there was a decree. Now, if you go to Kaliningrad, Königsberg, uh, everywhere we have the, the sightseeing map. You have this castle already there. There are pictures of the castle. You can see the, the <coughs> photographs of uh, places to see in Kaliningrad. The castle is there. Uh, they did not even start because the Minister of Finance refused to carry out the, the decree of Putin. Just say, well, there will be not a penny for the castle. We just give the penny to the, the, this money to the banks rather than building the castle. That, that's how it is. As we know, in spite of decades of persecution from Stalin to Brezhnev, there, there was a, a socialist left opposition in Russia and in the Soviet bloc. And when the system was collapsing at the end of the 80s, I expect a, a, you and a lot of other people probably hoped that there could be some sort of socialist democracy set up. Um, and, uh, you know, history fooled us again, but do you, do you see any hope for that at all down the road? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, there is always hope, but not the way, <laughs> not the way uh, we used to see it. You see, because uh, the initial theory, which I shared among other people, was that with uh, capitalist contradictions, uh, class struggle will come back and, uh, and class interests will come back, because it was very clear that Soviet working class did not have any class consciousness, and it, uh, it didn't believe that uh, uh, there was a problem with capitalism, because they didn't believe Soviet propaganda, and for the good reason, because they lied them. They did lie them. And you know, there is a joke that uh, we, uh, we learned, we knew that everything they were, telling us, they were telling us about our own society was a lie, and so we thought that what they were telling us about capitalism was also a lie. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> Too late, we discovered that what they were telling us about capitalism was true. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I remember workers uh, at a workers uh, at a workers conference, workers from from an automobile factory saying that 
well, you should introduce unemployment in, in, in Russia because there are too many lazy workers around. So the only way to discipline the workers is to introduce unemployment. Workers saying, activists, workers activists saying that. And, uh, and I said, don't, are, are you not afraid that you will be the ones to be laid off? And they, and they produced terrible cars, awful, a lot of cars, just, just junk cars. And they said, no, no, cars are always needed, so why should we be un, uh, laid off? We are producing cars, we are producing good stuff. And uh, at that moment I, I saw the, the, uh, there were two miners sitting nearby who laughed and said, that these idiots, they think they're producing good cars. They, they, they themselves have to be laid off, they have to be set fired. Uh, all, the, all these producers of junk cars, they have to be, to be, to turn in, to be turned into unemployed. And then I turned to the miners and I said, well, uh, don't you think that you will have a problem with unemployment? I said, no, no, coal is always needed. There was always a need for coal. Why should they lay off us? So everybody was sure that everybody else should be laid off, but not us. Why should we, we be the victims? So now it's not like that anymore. In that sense, this is passé, this is over. Uh, uh, the problem is that people are lacking the experience of collective action, and especially collective organized strategic action. So because they can protest, there are protests. Or there, we had a, pro a project at our institute for like five years monitoring social and labor conflicts around the country. There are uh, actually hundreds of them, and, uh, uh, and there, uh, every month there, there are a few hundreds of, of events happening here and there. But they're not strategic, they're not organized, they're not uh, uh, having a perspective to develop into national campaigns or even to, sometimes even to, into local campaigns. So they're very, very, very local, very, very uh, kind of limited to, the, to a very particular case, not generalizing. And uh, again, the point is that uh, I don't believe that you can now have a proper class politics in Russia, but you can have a social bloc, you can have a broader social bloc uh, in which you have to make uh, political compromises to, to develop uh, a movement uh, to bring about uh, what we call the new welfare state to start with. Uh, or we call it social republic in a more radical way. Uh, it's, it sounds a bit more, more, more radical, more left-wing. But the point is that anyhow what people want is they want to retain the welfare state, they want to develop the welfare state, and they want mixed economy, that's also true. But how mixed? It's a different story. What is it, the mix? You know? And uh, that also means that we will have to make deals. We'll have to make deals not only uh, to bring uh, together different segments of, of the working class, of the, of the labor force, and so on, of the middle class, but also some segments of the bourgeoisie, some segments of, of, of business, which want to produce for domestic market, for example, which want to expand uh, domestic economy rather than just sell oil to... to to China. So in that sense, it must be a cross-class alliance. And by the way, I think that the successful leftist projects now, so far, like, uh, like Syriza and Podemos, they're also not based on pure class politics. They're also creating cross-class alliances. So in that sense, I think such a perspective is possible in Russia. And by the way, uh, we're saying, well, the left is very, very weak, but you see, uh, it's true, though we remember that during the protests of 2011, it was the left front which was one of the biggest forces in, in the Moscow protests. Uh, though I think they were extremely confused in their politics, but just the fact is that there were lots of red flags there. And, um, well, Syriza was also very weak 10 years ago, five years ago, or three years ago, Syriza was very weak. It just emerged almost from nowhere. Uh, so I think uh, the left can grow in Russia very fast if we uh, get into the period of uh, instability and the period of social change. Do you want to ask questions? Yeah. Kind of, you have already mostly answered the question I was going to ask, but I guess I'll make a comment instead. But um, I wanted to thank you for um, highlighting some of the, um, the elements of privatization, continuing privatization that's happening right now um, in Russia, because I feel like that is something that doesn't get covered um, as much as it ought to in I was, I was in Moscow in 2012 and 2013 um, doing research with um, youth activists. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that did strike me about the protest was that even though the central themes were sort of for fair elections, Russia without Putin, um, all, all along the sides, there were people protesting cuts to pension, cuts to health care, 
um, closing clinics, closing schools, all this kind of stuff, and so it's deeply important. So I was going to ask you if you thought that either that, that there was much of a prospect for um, populist mobilization on, on those kinds of issues, but if I've already spoken to that issue. Yeah, I, I should say one thing that, uh, ironically, uh, there is one uh, problem here. As long as Putin is in power, uh, social protest will not become uh, a dominant uh, uh, form of protest and more or less I think most of the population will stay passive because the there is a very deep um, kind of element in, in, the, in the public mentality that uh, as long as we have Putin we have a coalition government as long as we have Putin we have compromise which means that the extreme neoliberal reforms are going to be stopped by Putin so we're going to have some of these reforms, but not in, the, in, its, in their extreme form. And it's the only option we have. So it's like, uh, 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 as I once wrote, so the, the choice is between some kind of centrist schizophrenia of, of the current uh, system or uh, neoliberal paranoia of, of the financial bloc. Uh, and, uh, and only if Putin goes, which is not excluded, in this case, uh, all these uh, segments of society, which, has now, which are now passive, they will immediately uh, move into action. And uh, that will change the situation almost overnight. And that was, by the way, the situation in, in Eastern Ukraine. Because Eastern Ukraine was extremely passive. They were not really supporting Yanukovych, but they were not protesting against Yanukovych either. They were just passively uh, watching what was happening in Kiev. And, uh, uh, and they basically thought that though Yanukovych was not a good guy, but as long as Yanukovych was there, nothing terrible was going to happen for, for them, not to them. Uh, nothing terrible was going to happen to them because uh, he kind of uh, considers the interests of the East. Once Yanukovych was out and was uh, uh, thrown out in a violent way, so then they thought, OK, there is nobody in Kiev who defends our interests. There is no protection against the forces from Western Ukraine, which they considered to be uh, totally hostile. So in that moment, they started mobilizing, organizing, they started protesting, they started organizing their own forces, their own opportunity, and so on and so on, which uh, led to the, the whole, to the real collapse of the state. On the other hand, I, I think it was uh, also the miscalculation of the, of the new people in Kiev who considered that these people in the East were going to stay passive as they used to stay passive forever. And all of a sudden, they said, no, they're not passive. That's the same miscalculation Russian liberals are now making. They think, okay, you, we, we get rid of Putin, we'll replace Putin by Medvedev or by Kudrin or whatever, uh, or Putin just steps aside for a little while, just pretty, pretending being ill, uh, which is possible, and then the rest of the country will swallow it. And it will not. And uh, that's exactly where the real protest will, will start, the real movement will start. Not before that, I think. And this is our last question. Um, yeah, um, a couple of things I'm curious about. First of all, 60s and 70s, the, the United States sold a considerable grain, amount of grain to the Soviet Union under the um, long-term low-interest loans uh, mm -hmm. given to Russia booked for that pur purchase. In 79, of course, it, the grain was embargoed uh, by President Carter. And I'm wondering two things. One, did that lead to Russia's uh, economy collapsing in the, the, the late 80s, uh, or have, have a, an impact on it collapsing? And secondly, um, has the Russian uh, agriculture developed itself now that it's not so dependent on imported grains? OK, uh, it's a very good question. First of all, yes, I, I think that the grain embargo of uh, Jimmy Carter did not affect the situation uh, a lot. Maybe somewhat, but not, not massively. The more, more important factor was the decline of oil prices in the late 80s, which affected the Soviet Union quite, quite dramatically. Because the American grain was <coughs> replaced by Canadian and uh, grain and French grain and so on, so it did not lead to it, it, made, it became more expensive. Right, that's what it was. It became more expensive. No, exactly, the point is it became more expensive, but as long as the Soviet Union continued selling oil at high price, that oh. was no problem. Once the oil prices went down, at that point, it all became a pro uh, one big problem. 
uh, uh, it's very similar now. So speaking about agriculture, Russia now is exporting grain. Russia is exporting grain. Why? Uh, because on the one hand, uh, grain became an international commodity, and, uh, and Russia is uh, creating an economy of specializing in export commodities. So in that sense, grain is just one of them, alongside with oil, alongside with, uh, with, uh, with nickel, alongside with gas, yes. It's one of the export commodities. The problem is that, uh, uh, that Russian agriculture is uh, remaining underdeveloped. So instead of developing agriculture, they're developing uh, commercial production of grain for export. It's not the same thing, as you can understand. And uh, for example, they uh, they're creating in southern Russia. They're creating latifundia type, uh, latifundia type estates, uh, latifundia type enterprise, like in Latin America or uh, monoculture kind of huge estates. And uh, uh, the rest of Russian agriculture is, uh, and rural areas are very often decaying and continue to decay. Uh, and Russia is ex importing a lot of food. So it's exporting grain, but it's importing meat, it's importing uh, cheese, it's importing quite a lot of stuff, which it can produce domestically. And uh, now, when there was uh, this, uh, the, the sanctions and the counter sanctions on the European Union, quite a lot of people in the Russian agricultural community were very happy because they said, oh, finally, they will develop Russian agriculture. Uh, and for almost a whole year, they didn't give a penny additional to develop agriculture. <laughs> so instead, they started replacing import by another import. Importing things through Belarusia, through, or, or, or from Ch importing apples from China, rather than from Poland, and so on and so on. There are, there are millions of tons of apples in Russia, which you cannot deliver to the major cities like Moscow, because the roads are in terrible conditions, and because there are no structures to work with that. So, so, so the, these apples just disappear, they just rot. At the same time, they, uh, they, they get uh, millions of apples uh, from, from abroad. Why? Because you even technically, imagine if you're a big company working with agricultural products, what you do, uh, you just send one boy or one girl uh, to an office of a French or Chinese or whatever company, you sign one contract, and then the, the huge cars with, uh, with apples will come uh, to your stores, period. Forget about it. If you want to work with Russian farmers, you have to visit hundreds of these farms, organize deliveries, organize supplies, and so on. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of pain, and you have to do it uh, uh, out of what? Out of patriotism. Uh, well, uh, it's not something which stimulates for businessmen, you know? So, uh, so the state has to take care of that. The state has to work on that, to create uh, the new opportunities for those farmers to deliver their, their products to the markets, uh, fix their roads, create transportation opportunities and facilities and so on. The state must do it and that's, that's why I think there is a, a real need for uh, what, what we can call a Russian version of New Deal, at least, if, if not for more radical policies. I, I, personally, I will favor a much more radical policy, but, but even, even if you don't favor radical policies, there, there is an objective need to do something about roads, about agriculture, about domestic production, uh, about farmers, about uh, uh, industries which can have a tremendous development potential, but they need investment from the public sector and so on. And unless you do that, Russia will decompose, I think. And uh, that's why I'm optimistic, because I think Russia will not decompose. <laughs> so at some point, at some, in some way, we will find the solutions to these problems. Thank you. Thank you.